Good morning, everybody. I think the first and perhaps most important thing that I've got to do today is to say a really massive congratulations to Diane James, the team, and the hundreds of people that came and helped us with that spectacular result that we secured in Eastleigh. So I want to hear it from you. Let's hear the Eastleigh roar. But of course, Eastleigh wasn't a one-off, because since our last spring conference, we had a by-election in Corby, where Margot James did brilliantly in getting nearly 15% and our best ever at that time score in a by-election. And we fought a by-election in Middlesbrough, where Richard Elvin, from an absolutely standing start, managed to come second in that by-election. And of course, let's not forget Rotherham, where Jane Collins scored 22% of the vote and also came second in that by-election. And the question that the commentators are asking, the question that increasingly everybody in this country is asking, is what's going on? Why is UKIP surging? Well, I'll tell you, there is a wholesale rejection of the career political professional class in this country going on. We have had enough of them. And they really do all look the same and sound the same. They all go to the same schools, the same Oxbridge colleges. None of them have ever had a job in the real world, and not one of them is in politics for principle. And that's what we stand for, principle. And there are, there are millions of ordinary, decent people out there who feel betrayed by this political class, a class who appear to be more interested in their own careers and in what other foreign leaders think than what is in the national interest for the people of this country. And those people are turning to UKIP. And please don't just think that it's just tired Conservatives that are coming to UKIP. We're drawing our support from across the spectrum. And the really interesting thing, and I think the real potential that UKIP's got was shown by the fact that at Eastleigh, a third of our votes came from Conservatives, but the rest of our vote came from the Liberal Democrats, it came from old Labour, and interestingly, a significant number of the votes that we got at Eastleigh came from people who hadn't voted for anybody for the last 20 years. And we should be proud, as a party, that we're re-engaging those people. Well, of course, it's now been said that it's just a protest vote. Just a protest vote, nothing to worry about, just a few midterm blues for the coalition. Well, I'll tell you, it's something far more powerful than a protest vote. People are turning out and voting for UKIP. Yes, some of them, perhaps some of them do want to stick two fingers up to the establishment, which is pretty understandable, isn't it? <laughs> but actually, the vast majority of people who are going out and voting UKIP in those by-elections are doing so because we are the party that are putting forward positive, alternative policies that would make this country a better and prouder place. And we're not hamstrung by political correctness. We're not afraid to take on the issues that everybody else would like to simply brush under the carpet. I heard Nick Clegg yesterday saying that he welcomed the debate on immigration. Uh, the truth is that on immigration, those three parties, the Lib, Lab, Con, are all the same because they all support a total open door to the whole of Eastern Europe. They all support that door being flung even wider open to the 29 million people from Bulgaria and Romania. And as you heard from our previous speaker, Slavi Binev, things are in a pretty unhappy situation in those countries. But worse than that, they even all support Turkey joining the European Union with unlimited access for those 80 million people. And our message is simple. We are not 
against anybody. We wish people from all of those former communist countries the very best. But it cannot make sense for us to open our doors to massive oversupply in the unskilled labour market in this country at a time when we have a million young people out of work. That doesn't make sense. And it is an outrage, as far as I'm concerned, that from the 1st of January next year, people in unlimited numbers from Bulgaria and Romania can come to this country and within a very short space of time claim job seekers allowance, housing benefit, child benefit. I'm sorry, but the benefit system in this country should be there to be used by nationals of this country who in many places come from generations of families who have paid tax and national insurance into the central park. And, and as far as UKIP are concerned, nobody should be able to access the health service and the benefit system in this country until they have been in this country for five years, paid their taxes and obeyed the law. That would be right, that would be fair. If UKIP had not taken on this immigration debate, the others would not be talking about it at all. And it is not racist to talk about immigration. And I believe that by taking on this issue, this will be, I think, the major battleground on EU membership between now and whenever a referendum will come, because it is a basic facet of a state that you should be able to control your borders and decide in your own parliament who comes to live, work and settle in our country, and we will fight this battle. But of course it isn't just uh, immigration that we're campaigning on. Uh, what about household bills? That's absolutely at the top of people's worry in this country, and uh, whenever you get the electricity bill through, it's a bit of a shock isn't it? And yet once again we see that our career political class are indeed all the same because they all support the carbon targets agreed in Brussels. They are all enthusiasts for building what I think are ugly, useless, wasteful, expensive wind turbines that are now despoiling. despoiling Britain's landscapes and seascapes and for some years now we've said as a party that unless we get real on this really important question of energy that at some point in the future we face blackouts. Now you'd have seen in the newspapers yesterday that we may well now run out of gas within the next couple of weeks. So this isn't a problem that could occur in five years time, it's a problem that could be on us by the time the spring is over and what we are saying as a party is we have got to stop the billions of pounds of taxpayers' money that are being poured in to an utterly futile, useless wind energy programme. It must come to a halt and come to a halt right now. <laughs> and frankly, we need to have a referendum on the European Union, not in five years' time, but actually this year, because we need to stop the closure of those six coal-fired power stations, which will be closed down next year, which we're going to need to keep the lights on in this country. And you know, if you look just in the last couple of years, you see that both the aluminium smelters in this country have closed down. You see that steelworks in the north of England have closed down and relocated to India. So even if we were worried, about CO2 emissions, it doesn't make much difference, does it, if all we're doing is paying to close down British manufacturing and send it across to India. It's madness. Oh, and I nearly forgot, there's another issue on which they're all the same, and that, of course, is membership of the European Union. All three parties support our continued membership 
on the union. And we, of course, have campaigned long and hard and made the argument that we are not anti-European in any way at all. We wish to live and work and trade with our neighbours. We want to be friends with Europe, but we do not wish to be governed by the European institutions, by people the likes of Herman Van Rompuy. I was rather disappointed in the week when I heard that he's retiring next year. I shall miss him terribly. <laughs> but we've made the argument for years, and now it's a mainstream argument, that we want an amicable divorce from the political European Union and its replacement with a genuine free trade agreement, which is what we thought we'd signed up for in the first place. And I must say that the appalling events in Cyprus over the course of the last week have surpassed even my direst of predictions given in some of those helpful contributions that I've made in the European Parliament <laughs> over the last few years. Even I didn't think that they would stoop to actually stealing money from people's bank accounts. I find that totally astonishing. Um, I wish really in the wake of that uh, that George Osborne would say that under no circumstances would we ever do that to banks in this country because there is going to be a big flight of money and that flight of money won't just be from Cyprus, it will be from the other Eurozone countries too. And remember there are three quarters of a million British people who own properties or who live, many in retirement, down in Spain. And I think our message to them has got to be, now that the EU has crossed this line, now that we see they're prepared to resort to anything to keep alive their failing Euro project, our advice to those expats living down in the Mediterranean must be, get your money out of there while you've still got the chance. But to see the threats and the bullying that are going on with Greece, Portugal, Spain and Cyprus and to realise that actually none of it will do any good anyway because these countries should never have joined the Euro in the first place. But to see the monstrous bullying and intimidation that is going on tells me that actually we, UKIP, are the true Europeans because not only do we want to get the United Kingdom out of this anti-democratic structure, we actually want the rest of Europe to leave the European Union too and get back their independence and democracy in their own countries. <clears throat> now, of course, Mr Cameron has talked about the European question in a speech he gave the other week. You might have noticed it was rather heavily trailed and despite the fact that he'd said again and again and again, I do not want there to be a referendum on Britain's membership of the European Union, he has now said that if he wins the next general elect, sorry. <laughs> it doesn't look very likely, does it? If he wins the next general election and following a protracted renegotiation, did you see the other day that George Osborne went to object to the caps on bonuses for the financial market sector. He lost the vote by 26 to 1. <laughs> so I don't think the renegotiation really is terribly credible. But if all of these things happen, then in nearly five years' time, he might give us the opportunity to vote in a referendum. I'm sorry, Mr Cameron, if you thought that speech was going to get UKIP off your back, it is too little, it is too late, and frankly, coming from the man, who a few years ago said, I give you this cast iron guarantee <laughs> that if I become Prime Minister, there'll be a referendum on the Lisbon Treaty. The fact is, Mr Cameron, we don't believe you and we don't trust you either. <laughs> and I'll make a prediction here and now. It may well be that at the moment Mr Miliband and Mr Clegg are not promising 
a referendum in their next manifesto, but after the local elections on May the 2nd, where we tear into their vote too, they will make the same pledge, and you know what? We won't believe them either. <laughs> and yet, in the middle of all of this, we're discussing in Westminster other issues. And of course, the big one this week is regulation of the press. Now, I think we have to recognise that there were some very serious tabloid excesses. Indeed, I was a victim of the hacking scandal myself. I wasn't very happy about it. Uh, but as it turns out, we actually have legislation against all of the things that those newspapers did. And whilst it's time consuming and costly, we have had legal redress. Now, it looked for a period of time as if the Lib Dems and the Labour Party would press for state regulation, but the Cameron's Conservative Party would stand aside from that. But in a very odd deal that took place, we're told, at 2.30 in the morning in Ed Miliband's office with the hacked-off lobby group in the room, Cameron has decided that on this, as with virtually every other single issue, the three parties, the Lib Lab Con, are to be all the same, and they are all pressing for state regulation of the press, and that means a big, expensive quango. It means politicians doing what they can to get stories suppressed and doing it at a time when we have such a, an active and lively internet that it won't make any difference anyway. All it will do, all it will do is to damage the British newspaper industry and magazine industry. And as somebody that travels a huge amount around the world, I promise you, whatever you think of the British press, I think we've got the best and most open press in this country of any country in the world. And that whilst we acknowledge there have been excesses, and whilst we think uh, that perhaps a Royal Charter might be a good idea, we are opposed to politicians regulating the press in this country. We believe in freedom of speech. Is that clear? Now, I said at the Scarborough Spring Conference in 2011 that I believed this party had enough buzz and enough momentum that we could challenge and perhaps even overtake the Liberal Democrats as the third party in the opinion polls in this country. Well, in last Sunday's poll in The Observer, we were double the percentage points of the Liberal Democrats. And as I've said already, we're taking our votes from across the spectrum. But it appears to be the Conservative Party that is fretting the most about the progress that UKIP is making. Now, I rather think that the effect we have on the Conservative Party is actually more psychological than it is arithmetical. You know, the reason the Conservatives didn't do very well in Eastleigh wasn't actually because of Diane and UKIP. It was, it was because Conservative voters are used to listening to a Conservative leader that talks about business, free markets and aspiration, and they've now got a Conservative leader who talks about gay marriage and wind turbines. <laughs> so I think that's why, that's why the Conservative Party are doing well. And you will have heard from Conservative MPs, MEPs, and indeed in the editorials of some of our national newspapers, the call that a deal must be done between the Conservative Party and UKIP. And there are two things I want to say about that at this juncture. My first is that even if we were looking to do a deal, we wouldn't be doing it with a man who takes every single opportunity to abuse us, our ideas, our policies, and our millions of supporters out there in the country. There is no prospect at any time of us doing a deal with David Cameron as leader of the Conservative Party. But actually, doing a deal isn't my personal priority. I didn't come into politics to do a deal with somebody. 
for some sort of short-term personal or political advantage. I came into politics from business on a point of principle. I want my country back from the European Union and back from the career politicians. No, my priority, my priority is to make UKIP a mainstream political force in this country that changes the face of our nation. That is what we're here to do as a party. And we're going to go. We're going to go into the local elections on May the 2nd and we're going to fight the biggest ever domestic election campaign that UKIP has fought in this country. Many of you, over 1,700 of you, have so far come forward and put your names down to stand in the English County Council elections. And I know there are more of you in this room who, when my speech is finished, will be going to the back of the hall to volunteer to help the charge. Let's make sure that all those people out there that support us, that believe in us, that are backing us, let's make sure they've got the chance to vote UKIP on May the 2nd. These elections really do matter to us. We have to show the world that support for UKIP isn't just theoretical in opinion polls, but that it really exists. And as we can learn from the Lib Dems, now honestly, there are things we can learn from the Lib Dems, <laughs> but during that period when Ashdown was leader, you know, they focused on building up centres of excellence by winning district council seats, by winning county council seats. And once you've done that in an area, then you've got a realistic chance of fighting a parliamentary seat and winning it. So doing well on May the 2nd, establishing bridgeheads on those county councils up and down the country is very, very important. I haven't got a crystal ball. I can't predict what is going to happen on May the 2nd. But all I can tell you is going out and meeting people and looking forward to my fortnight's bus tour uh, of England, when I'm going to come and support many of your campaigns, the vibes are good. We won a council by-election in East London this week. We won a council by-election last week in Surrey. The vibes are good, and we must give it everything we've got, ladies and gentlemen, between now and May the 2nd, and let's make this a real huge success. <laughs> and, of course, we'll, we'll have an eye out for the next parliamentary by-election, and we'll fight that with all the vigour that we've got. But once May the 2nd is over, the priority then is to get this party ready to fight the European elections in May of next year. Those elections will take place on the same day that thousands of, di of district council and unitary authority seats are up. And it is my aim and my ambition that in those European elections next year, that we turn the tremor that we caused in British politics in Eastleigh into a national earthquake by winning the European elections next year. That is our goal and that is our aim. <laughs> and if on the back of those European elections we are able to win hundreds of district and unitary seats up and down this country, added on to whatever we can achieve on May the 2nd this year, we will then have built up those hotspots, those centres of excellence. And with that momentum, and by showing the electorate we can succeed under first past the post, and by beating down the biggest obstacle that's ever happened to UKIP, which is that it's a wasted vote, by showing people that it's not a wasted vote, we can then mount a serious, credible campaign for the general election of 2015. We are not there yet, ladies and gentlemen, but it has been my honour over the course of the last year to lead you to see the fantastic progress that we're making. We're not there yet, but I'll tell you what, we're getting closer. Thank you.